If you've got somebody who's sitting in a role who's the uncle, the auntie, the brother, the, whatever it might be, who's not performing well in that role, um, that starts to create a, 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 an animosity, if you like, throughout the organisation. How come How come Deborah gets away with that? You know, if it was me, I wouldn't. So uh, you've got to be very, very careful that you're managing them in the same way that you would manage any other employee in the business and that they're being measured on what yeah, they're doing. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And I see, um, you know, I see families who, when they're grappling with these sorts of things, they they will develop an employment policy, and mm. and the policy might say, for example, that one family member can never report to another family member. Yeah. So you, they should always be reporting to a non-family. So hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I'm joined by Ian Blakely, who is a New Zealand chairperson of the Family Business Association. Welcome, Ian. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, it's lovely to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about something I'm very passionate about. Yeah, you and me both. So we're going to be talking about family businesses today, and that's um, something I know we both share a common passion in. Tell me about your journey into getting into family businesses. Um, well, I, I have got into them as an advisor, and um, I started out advising family businesses when I was a partner at a Uh, one of the big four accounting firms and I kind of was a natural progression of the work I was doing there I was so I was I was advising um, from a tax perspective mainly a whole lot of New Zealand family businesses Mm -hmm. and um, as often happens when you're um, in a a role like that in in a firm like that the conversations with the family business owners tend to um extend beyond just the specialist topic that you you know you're there to advise them about, and you become a much uh, kind of a broader advisor to them, and more a sort of a bit of a, a, I don't know, a second opinion or a wise head or or whatever you want, a mentor or whatever you want to call it, but yeah. just someone who is able to share you know a reasonably broad range of experience with um, with your clients, and so I've found myself advising family business owners on a range of things, and then we started to um, look more closely at the you know, the succession issues with family businesses. And yep. and New Zealand was going from, you know, being a ha- having a, a, a sort of family business paradigm where owners would, um, you know, the, the beach to batch and the BMW sort of thing, where they'd, they'd get in their 40s and they'd, they'd had it all and they'd sell their business and go to the beach and play golf, you know. And, but that wasn't happening anymore. And people were thinking longer term and they were more concerned about, you know, what's the next generation um, going to inherit what what does the world look like for them? Mm-hmm. What security are we leaving for them? What are we doing for our communities? What's this money all about? What's it for? So um, you know those those sorts of discussions started to take place more. And um, yeah, so I I, the, I was doing that work when I was at this firm, and then I I left it and went to do my own thing. And I realised I I needed to learn more from yeah. other family businesses. And there was nothing in New Zealand really to tap into. There was no organisation that that represented them um, solely. Which is kind of odd because there's quite a lot of family businesses here in New Zealand, isn't there? There are loads, yeah. and and there are lots of different business organisations and you know member organisations that deal with different aspects of of being in business. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was no entity, no member organisation that it dealt exclusively with family businesses. And I asked some of my family business clients, you know what. Um, you know, what is something that we could do for you? You know, what, what do you want help? most? How can we yep. help? And, and they said, well, we really want to meet other family businesses. You know, mm. it's, it's, it can be lonely in business. Um, yes. You get to meet your suppliers and your customers, but you don't really have those conversations with other family business owners about the sorts of issues that, that you know, you have as a family business owner. And it's different to being an ordinary sort of business owner. Family business has far more dynamics in it, so it's not even like you can talk to your local, um, you know, private business that is not family-owned. It is quite a different dynamic, isn't it? Well, it is, yes. Um, uh, and, I mean, there are a lot of things that are the same, mm-hmm. but uh, for sure it's to- it's different when you have family members working in the business. Um, you know, there's, they're not just, they're wearing so many different hats. You know, they're not just brothers and sisters and daughters and fathers and mothers and sons and uncles and yep. nephews and things. They're, they're um, wearing hats as employees, as, as fellow directors, as trustees. You know, there's so many things going on and, yep. and you overlay the family dynamic of emotion over the top of it all and it's, um, you know, it's a pretty interesting Space. Yeah. Um, so they were saying to you, we want to so meet other family businesses. We want to meet other family businesses. And I, and I, 
and I wanted to get better as a family business advisor, and I wanted to meet other family business advisors mm -hmm. as well as businesses. So I, I heard of this organisation in Australia called the Family Business um, Family Business Australia, yep. now called the Family Business Association. And um, I went to one of their conferences, and I was just blown away by the uh, the quality of the material. The, the, they had international speakers, mm. um, you know, top um, people in, who specialise in family business advice from around the world, as well as um, some amazing family businesses from Australia and and other parts of the world. Um, mm. All speaking, uh, sharing their stories, um, which is what it's all about, it's how they learn, mm -hmm. and then mingling and mixing afterwards and having the social, you know, the social time and having fun together. And it was incredibly powerful. And I learned more in, you know, a week at that than I had in the previous couple of years. So um, I thought, I, I want more of this. And they were interested in doing something in New Zealand. And so we, you know, we, we I, I worked with them to set up a similar organisation in New Zealand, which is was called Family Business New Zealand, now yep. called the New Zealand you know Family yep. Business Association, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we're a member based organisation, um, mostly family business members and some advisors yep. who specialise in advising family businesses, uh, and our job is to just connect family businesses with other family businesses, provide a vehicle for them to share their stories, mm -hmm. provide a vehicle for um, some of that expert knowledge to be passed on through education programs, um, and also a vehicle for people to have fun. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Now, you kind of started on that journey back in 2017-18, and I think you launched the 1st of July 2019. Mm. So how many members have you got in the organisation now? We have 120 members now. Yeah. That's... And um, so we, you know, we, we're pretty happy with that. We, it's, mm. it's good. Um, and we're always, you know, trying to get the story out, trying to get more members. We, we tend to find that people come along to our events um, and that's how they find out about us. It's how they get to know other family businesses and they might come to two or three and then they decide, you know, I want to do more of this. I want to... Join, say, one of our forum groups, which are probably our most um, considered to be the most valuable thing that we do, really, I think. Yeah. Um, so that's where you get together uh, with other so family you, business owners. Yeah, in you join monthly a, environment, Monthly, is it? Or? That's right, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so they join a group. Um, there'll be seven or eight in a group. They're, yep. they're not competitors. Mm -hmm. um, and they meet regularly. They set their own agenda. They have a facilitator. Yep. They decide what they want to discuss and where they want to do it and whether they just want to have a social time occasionally or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, and the discussions, as the trust builds over time, yep. the discussions get more and more intimate, more valuable and, you know, more important to them. And, and they form a bond, you know, a really important bond. I was a member of EO for mm. about three and a half years, a similar sort of um, set up, but obviously not for family businesses. And I think it was, we always talk about getting to the 5% you don't talk about with anybody else. Once you've got that trust, yeah. you really have an opportunity like, to talk about things that mm. nobody else will quite understand or nobody else that you can trust to actually have that conversation with. Exactly. So I'm assuming yeah. your forums are the same. That's yeah? exactly what happens. Yeah. yeah. And then they start, they sh um, I mean, they share people, they share resources, they yeah. sh they do deals, they <laughs> say, look, uh, you know, I'm looking for an opportunity for one of my kids to have some work experience somewhere and they might go and work with one of the other ones. And nice. All yeah. those sorts of things. You know? oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And you also work very close with Family Business Australia as well, don't you? So you a lot of the things that are done are sort of done in conjunction with, so we can go and do the Family Business Conference over in Australia if you want to, or you can do the one over here. Yeah? Um, absolutely. We're, inter we're, we're interdependent. Yeah. Um, you know, we need Family Business Australia. Mm -hmm. um, it's our parent organisation. Uh, it provides a lot of the back office to us. We just could not have started this without them. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, with, you know, their, their ongoing support is critical. Mm -hmm. They've got the the um, they've got the agenda. They've got all the material, teaching material, all the courses, um, all the experience. So uh, yeah, we absolutely need them. They're part and parcel of what we do. Nice. Yeah. So you've been in family business for a long, long time. What do you see as being the fundamental differences between an ordinary privately owned business or even a publicly owned business and a family business? What would you say the key differences are? Um, I think the you know the emotion element is is a big one, right? Yeah. That's that's critical because the family and the business are intertwined. Mm -hmm. And you know, as we were talking about earlier, sometimes the um, you know the business is just another child of the parents. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, that's you know that's a big difference because it just causes them to think differently yeah. about business decisions. 
Um, and there's and, history and there too, isn't there? Because there's, there's a family history. We were doing some genealogy stuff yesterday and it's like yeah. talking about, you know, where did you actually come from and, and who's on what family and what's happened in that family. So all of that starts to come into the business as well. Absolutely. The discussion around, you know, what's our legacy, what, yeah. you know, where, where are we going? They, they tend to have longer term views, perspectives. Mm-hmm. They make longer term investment decisions typically. Yep. Um, or they may not, but, but yeah. that's, you know, typically they do. Um, and they've got to grapple with, with you know, potential downsides, which is, um, you know, how do you fire a family member? How do you, um, how do you not employ one because they're not quite right for the job? Or, yeah. or, you know, how do you avoid employing one because just because they're a family member, which is the wrong reason, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, those, there, there are pitfalls. Yep. And um, then there are benefits because often there's, um, you know, there's a level of trust often that, doesn't exist as instantly in you know in other businesses where mm. non family members are working together. Um, yeah. yeah, if you've you've been brought up in the same household uh, ordinarily, there would be a pretty high level of trust there, which is important. Absolutely, and an understanding of each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've worked with a number of family businesses in your in your lifetime. Um, what are the sort of the pitfalls that they tend to fall into? In general terms, we're not going to talk about anybody specifically, but you know, I'll tell you what, fascinating for me, um, mm. going through and doing the accreditation work that I've been doing with you guys through the Adelaide University was looking at the different family businesses around the world. And some of the biggest companies are actually family-owned businesses. So the LMVHs of the World Livertons, the, the Porsches, the Ferraris, the, um, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and I hadn't realised that there's that many family businesses. I think that we underestimate how many there actually are out there. And, but they do come with a very unique set of challenges, don't they? So what have been the things you've seen in your work with family businesses that are unique to a family business? Oh, I think um, I, there's many. Um, I think probably the one that is, is the most, uh, the one you want to avoid most and the, and the one that is most, is the saddest, is the potential for um business and the planning of the business and the way it's run and its involvement in the family to destroy the family, mm-hmm. right? That's yep. the worst outcome mm-hmm. and that's what you don't want. Yep. Um, uh, but it can happen, right? And maybe that TV series that's on at the moment, Succession, is a good example of I haven't of watched it yet, that, okay, yeah. You know, how that can happen. <laughs> yeah. It's a totally dysfunctional That's all based family. around Rupert Murdoch, and, isn't it? Well, the there's Loosely rumor, based there's on rumor, Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think, it, but it's a dramatisation of um, of a whole lot of different issues, and yep. and, um, and probably quite useful from that perspective um, mm-hmm. because it's a bit of a lens on you know what no one really wants to be like, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, when you s- families do get split apart by these things, and mm. and yeah, it's money, but it's also the you know the, the, they hold their business dear to them. Yep. Um, decisions that are made about it will influence the future of the individuals within the family. and So they've all got a stake in it. And when they disagree, it can be... And if they disagree in a way that gets on the front page of the paper, yep. it's not good. Mm. You know. We were talking before we came in here about the fact that um, there's the, the whole succession planning thing, obviously, is really, really important. But it's also... We talked about the, the, the business being a bit like their baby. So sometimes mm. when you're the founder of the business, the first person in the family to actually found the business, you've brought up this baby and trying to let go of that is really, really hard. But we know it's really important that we actually build the business up to have independence, just like we do with children. <laughs> um, what have you seen, it without giving away any names or anything, have you ever seen that um, challenge in a business where the owner... How, or the founder has been so wed to the business that they've really struggled to let go. Absolutely, I, I see it often. Um, yeah, and you kind of understand it, right? Because mm. um, founders uh, they're they're a type of a certain type of skills yeah. and experiences have got them to where they are, and those you know those skills and those ways of working. Um, and those values have um, been successful for mm-hmm. them. So they think they're important values, you know, yep. hard work and, and um, frugality and, and whatever and, and sacrifice, and yep. those sorts of things. That, I mean, they're the sorts of values that sit really strongly with founders and they tend to um, want to be in control of their own destiny right. as well. So it takes a lot to trust others. Mm. And, and so the... 
pitfall really is you know not letting go or not not developing that um, trust in the next generation yep. at the right time and and losing control of the succession transfer. Yes. Right. So if they, if they don't do it in a planned way, then the the con- potential consequences that it happens in an unplanned way, mm-hmm. and they have, don't have control of it. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't happen how they would like it to happen. Um, and it could be, you know, even sooner than they expect it to. Um, so, I, I mean, that's, I, I see a lot of that. And you kind of understand it because as parents, it is hard to see your kids as, um, you know. As, anything as, but as, kids. <laughs> well, as anything but your kids. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you always want to look out for them and, and help make decisions for them and and um, think they need your help. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Uh, and. You know, often they don't need it quite as much as we think. Yeah. And um, they've been brought up with, you know, some amazing values if they've been raised in that house of that founder. And, um, yeah, so so those are challenges. It's, it's just getting the kids to um, a point where you are comfortable with them to, to step up and move into positions, but also allowing them to do things in a different way mm. than the founder. Right. Well, I think particularly with ever-changing world as well. I mean, um, for yeah. a lot of us, we were brought up in a certain era and there were certain ways of doing things, but it's all changed. And so sometimes bringing on board the younger generation means that they actually will approach it in a slightly different way. Sure. They might have ideas that could be really beneficial to the business Absolutely. moving forward. Yeah, but yeah. it's hard. It's it tough better. to let go. It is hard. Yeah. It is hard to let go. And, and of course, you know, the kids are brought up in this house where they might not have seen their parent who's a founder very much. Mm. Yeah. Right. They've been working on their other baby, and um, and so that's an issue, right? And and the parents actually may not want their children to um, be the same sort of parents as them. Mm. They might want their kids to have more time with their grandchildren than than yeah, they, they have did. there. So yeah, um, that's a different approach to parenting, and it's a different approach to running your business when you don't want your kids to maybe work as hard as you did yep. as the founder because you want them to have more time with their family. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's different things going on. And, and, of course, the founders are often, you know, they're, um, they're kind of immigrants to wealth, mm-hmm. right? They, they, didn't, they may not have had it when they were born themselves. They have yeah. created the wealth themselves. So yep. they've come to it and they've learned, uh, they've had to adapt and learn what, how to live in the, in the world of wealth. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it is like going to another, a new country and, and experiencing a new culture. It's a different way of living. Yep. Um, but the kids aren't immigrants to wealth. They've born. They've been born into it. Into it <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. So they've got a different view of. Yeah. I mean, I know my own kids used to think money just came from. Or from a cash wall, point machine. Right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Or a credit card. Just use the credit card, yeah, Dad. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, you know, that's another, another wee challenge that they have to deal with because they've got different different outlooks on yeah. on money and life. And, yeah, and, and then, so of course, on. we get to third generation and it's a completely different story altogether, isn't it? And Yeah, and they're not even brought up. The third generation aren't necessarily brought up in the same household as the founder, right? Yep. So they're not going to – they're one they're step not away from those values and, yeah. and so on. And there's been another person come in to influence them who will be there, you know, the, the, the other spouse who's a non-family Mm-hmm. You know, non founders family member. Yep. So that's growing the family kind of intellectual capital and social capital, but it's also changing its dynamic from a culture point of view. And, yep. and so those, the cousins will have even more different mm-hmm. outlooks on life. life. And business, so when you, yeah. you know, when you're a founder and you've got a few children and, and you're contemplating them becoming involved in the business, you kind of have to get your siblings, the, those siblings, to work together as a team somehow. Mm. And I don't know about you, but I, I mean, I see a lot of families where the siblings are pretty competitive. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> They're not necessarily <laughs> used to working together collaboratively. They're mm. used to competing with one another. That's right. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that in itself is a, a challenge, but at least they, they were brought up in the same household and they know each other deeply well. And, um, 
And so I do find you can often go yeah. a lot deeper, a lot quicker because you've got that trust. But at the same time, there's also quite often a lot of history in the family that actually affects the way they think about each other. So we've all got our issues from our past, that you know, from our growing up and our childhood. And when you've grown up in a family, there's always that um, that your brother was this way in the family, which might be completely unrelated to the business, but there's that still sitting in the background, um, is, some resentment yeah. or, or some you know, feeling that mum and dad were favoured one more than the other, which which happens not deliberately, but parents you know, want to look after their children. They think they're doing it equally and it isn't always equal. <laughs> yeah, or someone got a better bike yeah. or, you know, then for Christmas or... I'll never forget, my, first... my brother got a stereo at a younger age than I did because he was a boy and he appreciated music more. I'll never forget that, you know, you even as an adult, go, I kind of... go, Deborah. Let's yeah, <laughs> I can't let it go, you know. It's like, so right. what I'm saying is you imagine if I can remember that, that that, that dynamic can come exactly. into a business as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And of course, um, you know, the first child probably came along at a time when the you know the parents were, were just starting out yeah right and they probably didn't at that point didn't have a lot of wealth mm-hmm. and were still doing it tough and still putting all their spare money into the business and working every hour they had and yep you know and then the last child might have come along at a, at a time when business is they booming they were able to send them to private school they were more yeah. affluent they, they could have holidays together and yeah so the First child thinks the younger one's been spoiled, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and doesn't know as much about hard work and things like that. So there's, there's a whole lot of dynamics that go on that getting to those siblings to um, work together as a team is, is fascinating. Mm. Um, but it's also they, important that they're put into the right roles as well, right? Because you shouldn't actually get a role in a business by birthright. It should be that you're looking at what the business actually wants and needs and find the right people to, to fill those positions. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, you know, fundamentally that's right, you yeah. know, that, that someone should fill a position in a business because they have the right skills and experience. Mm-hmm. Um, in a family business, um, weighing up whether someone's a family member or not – I mean, in my mind, I've always thought of it as being relevant to, mm. the, to the final decision. Okay. Because, um, but it's not going to it's not going to make someone who's not qualified for the role get the role. Yep. But it's relevant if you've got two candidates who are otherwise equal and one's a sure, family member. Then it makes more sense. You'll yep. give preference to the family member because you, um, well, because they're a family member. Right? Yeah. And, as long as they're on sort of equal footing in terms of yeah. And they want to work in the yep. business, and, and, and yeah, yep. and if they're otherwise, you know, equal. Um, or pretty close, then I think you'd weigh it in a little bit sure. in favour of them. I um, guess, it, I mean, I've seen it in, in lots of businesses. No. Yeah. Well, and it can yeah. be really detrimental because if you've got somebody who's sitting in a role who's the uncle, the auntie, the brother, the, whatever it might be, who's not performing well in that role, um, that starts to create a, 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 an animosity, if you like, throughout the organisation. How come How come Deborah gets away with that? You know, if it was me, I wouldn't. So uh, you've got to be very, very careful that you're managing them in the same way that you would manage any other employee in the business and that they're being measured on what they're doing. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And I see, um, you know, I see families who, when they're grappling with these sorts of things, they they will develop an employment policy. And and the policy might say, for example, that one family member can never report to another family member. Yeah. So they should always be reporting to a non-family member. Mm. Um, I've also seen families who insist that the the members go out and actually work for another company before they come back to work for the company. I remember the Joneses family, when we went to their, um, their event in Newmarket, you know, hearing about what they actually did to ensure that anybody who wanted to work in the business, had the opportunity to, um, but they were given the right training, the right, you know, go out and do something else for another business, then come back. I think that's really important. Yeah, the ideal is that, um, you know, they leave school, they go off and they do a course of study in, yep. in an area that might, might be unrelated to the family business, but useful to it. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it, it might not be related directly to the family business, but it might be a school that can be used in the wider family. And because they'll often have other investment activities and yeah. and so on. So um, they'll go off and get this, this skill and then go and work for someone else and, mm-hmm. and work in a different place and have a different manager and learn about the real world and, and yep. gain some financial independence and, and a bit of financial identity themselves and um, and learn you know how to pay bills and be responsible <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. um, and come back. And what they do when they come back is they, they enlarge the knowledge of the family. As a whole. By yeah. doing that, otherwise, you know, if they all stay within the family ecosystem, the family's not really getting any 
hmm. smarter or wiser or you know the, so, so it just adds to the family intellectual capital when yeah. they do that and of course in some family businesses you've got people who don't want to come into the business yes so you've got you know maybe even multi-generational family businesses where suddenly the people who are in the business in the family now do not be part of that business that creates its own challenges doesn't it Yes, it does. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, and you know, New Zealand's had to deal with that in the farming sector mm. um, uh, for a long time, and iwi do have dealt with some of these issues as well, of okay. course, because yep. they have a multi generational view of life, yep. you know, and and, and um, they've dealt with a lot of these issues. So you, you'll have, you know, family members who are part of the owner group, who um, you know, in a way, are beneficial owners, but. Mm-hmm. They, they're not involved in the business. They don't yeah. want to be working in the business, but nevertheless, they've got a say, right? And you have other family members who aren't even part of the owner group. You know, yep. They might be spouses of, um, but they're still part of the family because they're, they'll be parents of the next generation. Yes, um, but they're not necessarily in the owner group, so they've got a different viewpoint. They yep. might want to be involved. They might not want to be involved. They might want to. Have and nothing to do with it, but, mm-hmm. but they are part of the family. So the family needs to find a way to include all these people. Mm. Um, and one of the great things about, you know, when you've got a family business that is growing and is taking this into generational view and is, and is um, developing, you know, more wealth for, in each generation, is yeah. it means that the family can continue to support the growing family. Mm-hmm. And it can support that growing family in lots of different ways. Not they're just working in the business, like yeah. W- jobs in the business, or jobs in the. Some have family offices. Some, you know, some will have uh, family members who look after organising family events, or, um, mm-hmm. or or the family's other investment activities, their properties, yeah. whatever it is. Or um, they might just have family members who work in a in a charitable foundation mm-hmm. and do so, yeah, uh, work in the community on behalf of the family mm-hmm. um, as a way of you know doing good with their, their wealth yep. um, and giving back. Um, or, uh, you know, just family members who are good at looking after the next generation. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the other thing is, you know, when they've got this wealth, they can support family members who want to pursue vocations or careers that might not necessarily... Be um, part of that family business, produce, like, like like agricultural. You're saying is a great example is yeah. that you know you can actually have you can have farm owners who are particular fam, fa, family farmers who are particularly wealthy, mm-hmm. um, but their sons and daughters or, or you know cousins what don't want to actually work in the farming business. So you can actually create that as a a business that supports them through shareholder um, dividends and things, as opposed to actually working in the business. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think another you know good example is. Um, you know, I've seen seen a family business where they've had someone who's wanted to pursue a musical career. Oh, yeah. Right? And they, it's not instantly rewarding. No. <laughs> my my and husband's a musician, so... not rewarding yeah. at all, yeah. but they get the opportunity to pursue their passion because the family is privileged. Yes. And, and, and it can provide these opportunities for their family members. Yeah. But um, it all comes back to you've got to have all those discussions, haven't you? You've right. got to have all those conversations to work out what each person actually wants out of it, what the family as a whole wants out of it, what the, the bigger family trust wants out of it, to get really clear on how to support all those different members of the family, don't you? Yeah. Well, you've got a, you've got a business you have to look after Yep. and you've got to grow that. And mm-hmm. that's going to be focused on, um, all the things that businesses have to focus growth. on. Yep. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you've got to look after that and you've got to, uh, you've got to look after your family members, mm-hmm. um, and the family itself and grow a family that is cohesive. I'm, I'm pres- assuming that's what you want to do. You don't, you want to, a united family, a cohesive family that's having fun together and it's, and it's based, has shares values, um, and uh, is doing good in the community, yep. you know. Um, and can still get together around the, you know, for the family events without being each other, at each other's throats. I mean, that's a really important part of it, right. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you want all those things, and, and if you make the decision that you want this business to last for generations, you know, be a 100-year mm-hmm. family-owned business, then, um, you know, what we know is that 60% or more of the failures occur because you don't get the communication and trust right. Mm. So that's, you know, it's a soft thing, it's a soft skill, but it's fundamentally, um, that's what you've got to work on first. So if you're a founder, you need to find a way to start the conversations, and it's never really too early mm, to start true. them, yep. to start involving the kids in discussions about 
you know, money and financial literacy and, mm. and what mum and dad do and what the business does and what good it does in the community and to introduce them to some family members and and, and some, you know, some people in the business. And, yep. and sometimes, you know, the kids might have holiday jobs there, that kind of thing. It's never really too early to get them involved if the kids show interest. Mm-hmm. Um, but communication is the key. And well, if you think, I mean, it's the same with every relationship, like right? I mean, even even yeah. a, a, a one-on-one relationship, communication and trust are absolutely paramount to getting that relationship working well. Yep. Do you share the same values? Are you heading in the same direction? Yeah. Where are you going? And really what we've got as a family is just a, a multitude of those different relationships mm. that all have to be on the same page, exactly. that all yeah. have to know, um, you know, what's upsetting each other, what the issues are, how yeah. they're working through, how yeah. they resolve them. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't come by accident. No. Right. It just doesn't come naturally. It's it's it, everyone's busy. Yeah. And the founders and you know the business owners they they're just immersed in the business. Yeah. So it's something you have to work on, mm-hmm. and you have to set aside time for. Yep. So you have to do that, and you have to do you you've got to do all the housekeeping stuff. You've got to you've got to have the right legal documents. You've yep. got to have you know wills and trusts and yeah. all that stuff. You know, I was going to say your original background is a lawyer, right? It's just so, basic. Yeah. You have to you know that's <laughs> the, things fail if you don't get that right. But mostly people get them right because they go to their lawyers and they get it sorted out. But you have to, to think about the wider numbers. family too, though, don't you? Because if you, you think about it, when you when you've got people marrying into the family business or mm. marrying into the family which has a family business, you've got to ensure that you're actually protecting um, all parts all parties in that relationship as well so it is important to get the right advice and make sure you're doing the right things yeah and everyone you know every everyone's got a kind of slightly different approach to that but um yeah you know I, what i see is um, most families um you know they want they don't want their business to be broken up they don't want their wealth to be broken up mm-hmm. so they want to keep it within their lineage right yes. so yep. their bloodline essentially, mm-hmm. or adopted children, whatever, but yep. they, they don't want it to be split up because the relationships break up. Yes. Right, but they do want to keep supporting the next generation of children. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you've got to you know find a way to do that. that. It's te- yep. perfectly possible to do it, mm-hmm. um, but it comes back to you know get the legals right and make sure you've, you've got that trust and communication as much as, you know, work on having a great family as well as a great business. Yeah. And having a great family includes having in-laws who are happy and engaged and communicated with, who know where they, you know, what their rights are, yes. what the roles are for them within that family, mm-hmm. how they can help, how they can Support. develop their own, you know, develop themselves personally, mm-hmm. um, how they can support their children and what, you know, what life means for them if the relationship doesn't last. Yep. Let's face it, they don't all last. So what does that mean? Um, mm-hmm. And so as long as those conversations are being had, and there's no surprises, um, you know, you've got a better chance of success. Absolutely. Mm. Now, I always ask my guests to share some real practical tips for people. So I want to ask you on the spot, you know, three top tips for family business owners or members of family businesses. What would they be? Um, so in, in the in the context of the discussion we've been having around yep. intergenerational succession, mm-hmm. I would say, uh, first of all, just start now. Yep. If you, if you haven't already. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Start the conversation. Never too early. And if your kids are really young, um, then just start by talking to them about money because mm-hmm. I mean, they don't learn about that stuff at school. Um, and there are people out there in organisations who can help. But just start by by um, talking to them about some of these things and, and um, and role modelling the right behaviours around, um, you know, work, work ethic, and um, setting goals, and being diligent, and having fun, and respect for other people, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, all the sorts of things you'd want. Um, so start right away. Yep. And um, yeah, another tip would be do the housekeeping. So deal right. with if these. The, the kids are older and so there's some of those kind of grumblings beneath the surface, sense of inequality or anything that might be festering away. Get Bring it to the surface, deal with it yep. and move on. Right. Mm. Um, it can really hold a, a business back and I've seen that yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So deal with that housekeeping. So do your documents and yep. deal with all that, all that stuff. Um, and I guess thirdly is just keep working on the trust and communication yep. um, around the family. Keep Keep finding ways to get together. Mm-hmm. Um, be conscious of what hats you're wearing. So when you are together, you know, when you're having a family barbecue, yeah, you're you know, the family. Have, have rules. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're not you you you're not, you don't talk about the business at the at the Christmas barbecue or whatever. Yeah. Um, you you just all you know, mum, dad, brother, sister, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Um, and if you think about the three circles, the family, the business, and the ownership, it's yep. like you almost need to have a, a leader for each of those and a set of rules for each of those and a set of you know vision for each of those so that we're really clear where those boundaries are good idea. and they don't yeah. actually get intermingled. That is, yep. that is a good idea. So the owner group and the family group and the business group, mm-hmm. just um, you want all those things aligned yep. and on the same page, so you need that overall holistic view, but you do need some champions within each group. And that, that that. set those boundaries that say, hey, come on, so, guys, we're at a barbecue, not a good time to be talking about business right now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when you're sitting around a table as trustees, mm-hmm. having a trust meeting, yes. you're not um, you're not f- father and daughter or mother and son. That's you're not your relationship. You're co-trustees. Mm-hmm. So you're wearing different hats and you've got to think of each other as equals. Yeah. And, like, and really so how do you, yeah. you need to be able to create an environment where those discussions can take place and mm-hmm. people feel safe and comfortable um, expressing their opinions, yeah. even if they're much younger. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's important. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think, and then sometimes these things can be hard. So, obviously, there are advisors out there that can actually help you in all different areas, mm. business advice, the wealth management, the tax advice. Uh, and then I think the peer group thing, I mean, that's something I'm a real um, proponent of. I think that actually spending time with peers is probably where you get your best learnings uh, because they're, they're, they've been on that same journey. They've probably had all the same issues that you're going through and they can share how they have dealt with them. It's not from an academic point of view, but from a genuine, when I did, well, when we had this happen, this is how we did with it and I think that gives you a huge um, understanding and it doesn't feel like somebody's telling you what you should do but they're actually being able to share with you the knowledge they've gained from what's happened to them yeah that's, that's right um, I, I well it's how I learn yep. and um, and I that's how my clients tell me that they they learn so mm. you're right you, you get the people it's amazing what happens we have our conferences we put a couple of families on the stage yep. and they, we just ask them some questions and then the questions come from the floor um, and it's pretty powerful what happens absolutely really. and we had, we had another networking event recently I was at and um, there was a an elder kind of business founder family business founder yep. talking to a young young guy who was starting out in his own business mm-hmm. and they they didn't know each other before that event and they just happened to be in a group and they were chatting away and the younger guy was just thirsty for knowledge and yep. kept asking questions and the older fellow um, who's is stepping back and not as involved in his business but just loves passing on his knowledge and mm-hmm. coaching and yep. guiding he was just letting this young guy know what he knows and sharing his thoughts. Yeah. And they ended up establishing, as, resu- as a result of that, a um, a regular men- mentor-mentee yeah, sort of relationship. Uh, catch-up. Yeah, right. Perfect. And the older guy just offered his time. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that. And, and, and a, lot of, um, you know, a lot of people who have had success um, are more than happy to share their time with others and give their time to you know to others because yep. um, you know they want others to be successful as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, if they wanted to get in contact with you and they're interested in joining the Family Business Association in New Zealand, how do they do that? Uh, the best thing is to um, go to our website, so yep. familybusinessnz.org. Uh, okay. Familybusinessnz.org. Yes, got it. Yep. yep. Yeah. That's the website. <laughs> yep. And um, go there and check us out. Yep. And so you've got a whole raft of different um, things. Like you've got you've got formal education, you've got the, the networking get togethers, you've got the storytelling, you've got the um, you've got a whole range of things that can actually help. And the best thing you can do is get along to an event and, and meet some other people, right? Yeah, look if they, they give me a call. Yep. Um you know, my number's on the website, they can they can find my LinkedIn page, they can send me a, a message, um and uh get in touch with me. Yep. Um we'll make sure that they can come along to an event, see what we like, mm-hmm. get to know what we do and meet other family businesses yes and we'll go from there but um and it's a not-for-profit too right so this is actually all about helping um people in family businesses yeah 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 that's that's what it's all about Cool. The other thing I would say is, you know, obviously we share the same passion, right? I'm very passionate about family businesses and helping them. Um, If there's anybody who's listening into this podcast and they'd like to share their story and share some of the highs and the lows, because we all know it's not always um, highs, there's some highs and lows that go on there, I'd be really happy to have them come on and talk to me as well. So, um, and if you come across anybody who wants to share their story, I'd love to have them come on. Awesome. Yeah. 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 We should do that. That would be great. Well, look, thank you so much for giving me your time. Um, I had a great chat before the podcast and again in the podcast. Um, And so if anybody wants to get in contact with you, family, Family business, New Zealand dot, NZ dot org. org. Yep, yeah. or look you up, and they can give you a call directly. Yeah, That's fantastic. It. Thank okay. you very much, Ian. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks.